Stephen DeBoer, and I'm Canada's Ambassador and Permanent Representative to the World Trade Organization. It is my pleasure to welcome you to our workshop on border carbon adjustments. Interest in today's workshop has been exceptionally strong. In total, over 750 have registered to attend, representing a mixture of WTO delegates, government officials, international organization staff, industry representatives, and other subject matter experts. This level of interest demonstrates the importance and relevance of advancing discussions at the WTO on issues at the nexus of trade and environmental sustainability. Canada fundamentally be believes that the WTO and its members must work urgently to demonstrate how the multilateral trading system can meaningfully and credibly contribute to achieving global environmental sustainability objectives. Today's workshop is just one piece of the puzzle aimed at increasing the knowledge and understanding of WTO delegates on the subject of border carbon adjustments. BCAs are increasingly in the news as a potential tool that could have a role as countries move towards more ambitious climate policies in support of targets under, for example, the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. In November last year, the Government of Canada delivered its fall economic update. As part of this update, the government indicated that Canada is exploring the potential of BCAs. The government also noted the importance and relevance of working with international partners on this issue. Today's workshop is a demonstration of Canada's commitment and leadership in creating international dialogue, coordination, and coherence on the topic of BCAs. I would emphasize that we are not here to put forward Canada's views, but simply to, to increase understanding and dialogue on the issue. Our hope is that following today's discussion, trade policy practitioners will have addition, additional insights and perspectives to consider with respect to BCAs. We have put together an excellent group of panelists who will bring a range of perspectives to this issue, and I'm sure you're more interested in what they will have to say than in listening to me. I'll therefore end my remarks and introduce Dr. Carolyn Deer Burback, our excellent moderator. Carolyn is a senior researcher at the Geneva Graduate Institute Global's Governance Center. Carolyn is extremely active behind the scenes here in Geneva in working with WTO members and other stakeholders to foster meaningful dialogues on trade and environment issues and to take this work forward in leading the creation of the new Geneva-based Forum on Trade, Environment, and the SDGs in partnership with UNEP and the Geneva Trade Platform. We're extremely happy that she agreed to moderate today's discussion. Carolyn, the floor is yours. So good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Ambassador DeVore, for the very kind uh, introduction. It's really an honor to moderate um, this event today. So I'd like to start um, by thanking Canada, actually, on behalf of all of us for participating, all of us who are participating today, um, for taking the leadership on hosting this event. So you've rightly underlined the critical importance of enabling and fostering more dialogue, more robust dialogue across the diversity of the WTO's membership on climate and trade intersections, and also the importance of bringing a range of stakeholders into these discussions. Now, the number of people registered for this event today highlights the extraordinary interest in such dialogue. So stepping back, I think it's also important to remind ourselves that this discussion comes at a time when tackling the world's climate crisis is urgent. It's vital to remind ourselves that we're already facing today the brunt of that crisis. The natural disasters such as floods and fires, droughts and cyclones, changing weather patterns, threaten key production sectors and exports. And these costs and impacts fall disproportionately on developing country countries that have been touched by severe weather events. The business sector is also increasingly aware of climate risk to global supply chains, not as a distant prospect, but as an immediate reality. We're here at a time when the international community faces, faces the enduring challenge of meeting the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And also we're here in the middle of a pandemic that's provoked provoked an array of trade tensions, not least of which around access to vaccines and where issues of green recovery, recovery and green recovery, 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 recovery. So we're all 
has stressed um, the need to ensure that the WTO supports a more a greener and more climate change. And critically, it's not enough for any country to fix their climate footprint within its own borders. In an integrated global economy, the carbon footprint of our consumption is global. So we need to ensure that our trade policies help countries everywhere to decarbonize and to thrive. Now, as part of this puzzle, BCAs have already been under discussion for 15 years. There's a huge range of analysis already on the table, but it has new salience uh, because of the expressed interest of major economies in this topic, including the EU, um, Canada, as Ambassador Deborah mentioned, and also the US has expressed um, interest uh, in exploring this issue. Our BCAs are not the only climate trade issue on the table. Others include on the trade table, um, there's uh, climate standards, fossil fuel subsidy reform, trade-related transportation emissions, deforestation, sorry, deforestation-free supply chains, calls for aid for trade um, to support climate adaptation, and the shift to climate-friendly exports in developing countries. Now, all of these, these present questions on how to align trade policy with climate climate resolve and call for more dialogue and attention. On our specific topic for today, BCAs, governments face an array of challenging questions about their scope, the impacts of on competitiveness, challenges related to implementation and WTO compliance, fairness to developing countries, as well as impacts on MSMEs and supply chain management. So today we hope we can unpack and build understanding around some of these issues. To help us with that, I'm delighted to introduce a fantastic panel of four panelists. Um, Andre uh, Marcou, he's executive director of the European Roundtable on Climate Change and Sustainable Transition. He's going to provide some context, setting out what BCAs are, how they relate to the climate targets. Um, and we'll then turn to Aaron Cosby, who's a senior associate with the International Institute for Sustainable Development. He'll walk us through some of the options in the development of BCAs. And third, Ludivin Tamiotti, who is the environment team leader in the WTO's trade and environment division, will offer an overview of WTO implications of BCAs. And finally, Catherine Cobden, who is president and CEO of the Canadian Steel Producers Association, will share one of the many private sector perspectives on BCAs and what is needed from trade policy makings. Each of our speakers will present for 15 minutes. I will ding on my glass at 13 like this. Hopefully it will work better than that. And again at 15 so that they can keep time. And at the end, we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. Any participant can pose a question through the box at the bottom of your screen, but you must type in both your name and affiliation at the top as we will not take any anonymous questions. So let's get started. In our first presentation, Andre will bring to us some 30 years of engagement in climate change, energy transition, and sustainable development issues both as a pioneer of private sector involvement and in key public policy roles. He's recognized as a leading authority on carbon markets and on emission trading. Andre, you have the floor. Andre, you're muted, unfortunately. I'm sorry, I was very eloquent, but uh, and I, what I was saying, thank you, Carolyn, for that kind of introduction and thank you to Ambassador Bore and to Carlos and, and to Canada. Uh, I'm one of those Canadians stranded on this side of the Atlantic, so it's good to see the, uh, the maple leaves up there. Uh, <clears throat> if, I can, uh, if I can have the, the presentation, please. But as we uh, get the presentation, I think uh, Carolyn, uh, I'm, I'm waiting for the presentation. Uh, okay, there it is. Carolyn, you did mention a couple of things that are very close to my heart and that I really think that it's important to, to highlight, on, to, um, to emphasize. And those are the issue of, of development, uh, 
and not development, but sustainable development and that climate change and uh, the issue of border carbon adjustment, adjustment at the border needs to be seen in the context of sustainable development. I think that is a must. This is something that we've learned since Rio and that is very close to my heart and things that I've learned in my professional life. But coming back to, I'm here to tell you a story and the story is very much the context and how we got into this. I don't think you need to know how I got into this, but I got into this very much in a connection between emissions trading uh, and, and carbon leakage and uh, kind of noticing something in, uh, in the UNFCC discussion, something called response measures. And I found, I, I found some commonalities and that rest is history. And a lot of the, what I'm gonna tell you here today is part of the work that, that uh, we're doing at, at the round table on, on, a, on a large BCA project and Aaron and others are part of that. Now on the BCA definition, what is the BCA? Because people talk about the BCA CBAMs, we, we have names for them, but really what it is there for, it is there to alleviate the negative effect of asymmetric climate change policies. And we'll get into that very quickly. They can have three main objectives, the adjustment at the border for carbon. They can have the uh, uh, objective of leveling the playing field in those competitive markets, charging for a ton of carbon, the same price as it is in, in, uh, in the case of Europe, as it, it is produced in Europe, or producer of steel in Europe should pay the same amount for carbon as a producer in China. Uh, the pre to prevent leakage of carbon emissions to jurisdiction weaker policies, we frankly, we, what we don't want, we don't want for industry to move from one place to the other uh, in search for, uh, uh, in search for uh, lower uh, regulation and less strict regulation. And all that would result in is, a, uh, uh, is an increase in emissions globally, which is not what we want. And, and finally, to incentivize, a lot of people are talking about incentivizing trade partners to strengthen their own climate policy efforts. That is not un, uh, uh, controversial because the Paris Agreement has a bottom-up NDC nationally determined element to it. Next, please. Now, what I will take you to, uh, quickly through this because I don't think that we can go line by line, but what these two slides are telling you the story is that there is a symmetry in the uh, climate targets. We know that the Paris Agreement is a promise. And that promise is that we will all move on the same direction, on the same slope and increase the level of ambition in a parallel way. But that is a promise and that needs to happen. And what is really happening right now in, in this case, we look at the NDCs and the 2050 and 2030 targets. First of all, we see that there are a number of countries, 73 countries submitting uh, new NDCs, but only few countries have input a stronger NDC and they are listed out there. Uh, we have a number of countries that have net zero targets and that list is increasing. Uh, Canada's part of it, I'm proud to say, the United States, China by 2060. But nevertheless, what we see is the fact that there is an asymmetry in, in, in the uh, level of, of targets. And we also see the fact that uh, that asymmetry is not moving away fast enough. We're not, it doesn't disappear. Next slide, please. This is, this is something uh, source of the climate action tracker and shows you kind of the, uh, the European Union ahead of the curve compared to the rest of the world. And that is not something that again, we, we, uh, we uh, advocate, we, it's not our doing or not our doing, it's the reality. And this is why we are getting to some degree in this discussion. So the conclusion that you, you take from here is yes, there are there is a symmetry in climate change uh, targets and the level of effort that different countries are putting. And it happens that the United the European Union is moving ahead at this point and it has a more ambitious target. Next, please. Now, how does it fit in UNFC? Or it doesn't fit in the UNFC negotiation. The reality is that this is something that so far has eluded people. And if you go to the UNFCC, people don't really want to talk about it and has not found a real place until now. And, and thank you, Canada, for this in WTO discussions. Uh, in the UNFCC, the only place that it, and I shared that for three years, but the only place where that, that fits in, in that there's something which is highly political and highly controversial and very charged is something called response measures. 
and does appear under uh, under the uh, the Kyoto Protocol under and under the Paris Agreement under Article 415, which says that parties shall take into consideration in the implementation of this agreement the concerns of parties uh, with economies most affected by the impact of response me measures. Now, border carbon adjustment is part of response measures that uh, some countries are putting in a response to climate change or addressing climate change. So that is the place where this actually fits currently in, uh, in, uh, in the Paris Agreement. It also may fit under Article 6.8 in the Paris Agreement if, if you think about it very well. Next, please. Now, there is talking about BCA climate and, and, and the sta status of this. Now, what I will say is that it is the flavor of the day. I'm, I'm sorry to say this, but I, this is, you know, I've been through many flavors over the last number, 20, 25 years that I, you know, I started dealing climate, doing climate change after the Rio conference. So it's been a while. And this is something that has been always in discussion, but in many cases we brought it to the table and people in many official capacities have told us, why do you guys bring this stuff in? This is only going to create trouble. Well, it is now on the agenda for many people. We look at the, uh, in California, California is the one jurisdiction that has one for electricity, has contemplated one for, for, for cement, but hasn't put it, uh, one in place. New York State, so this is a state level, uh, is a contemplating one. Uh, we know this has come up in the discussion between Prime Minister Trudeau and, and President Biden. We see the United Kingdom, which is holding the COP26, hopefully in Glasgow, this at the end of the year, and is, uh, is holding the G7 presidency as uh, the Prime Minister uh, Boris Johnson, uh, trying to see if he could use the G7 uh, bully pulpit to, uh, to uh, get the G7 countries to act together on this. The Ukraine, very concerned, but you know they think they can do this through the EU, a key. A key we see China, at least in our experience, so far cautious about this, this issue, but it is on the agenda. And we've, hold, we've held town hall meetings and people are aware that this is on the agenda. Now, why is, what is the impact of this thing? You know, we've, we, this is the result of a study that we've done uh, for one of the multilateral institutions on the cost of, of, of a, a CBAM uh, on uh, India, Vietnam and, uh, and Thailand. And on the number of sectors, and we, I just picked one slide, and that is preliminary result of India steel on a CBAM for the EU. Again, it's on the back of the envelope, it's not a dynamic model. But what we're looking at in, in the year 2023, we're looking at somewhere uh, quite a significant amount of money, scope one and scope two. We see that 123 million, 158 million. And it's about a competitive loss, which is CBAM payment of a current price is about 10%. Now, 10% is not an insignificant number. And we know that at 15 euros a ton, also that could, you know, that will also produce significant result for the aluminum industries and other industries. So this is something, this is why this is turning heads and grabbing the attention of people. Next, please. Now, why are we discussing this now? We're discussing now because of the uh, continuous symmetry and the fact that, to be quite blunt, there is a European Green Deal on the table. It's got many moving parts. I mean, I can take you for you know, hours on what the Green Deal is, but the Green Deal has a EU climate law and climate neutrality. It increases the level of ambition for the EU from 40 to 55%. And that's what even more relevant, and, and I hope somebody in here has been long on this. It it raised the price of your allowances for five to forty within a within a three year time span. Now you know if it's an eightfold, eight hundred percent increase, that's a heck of an increase in any market. Next, please. Now. Competition in the EU has uh, competition has always been a concern for the EU. Uh, since it had the EU ETS, that has been always something important. And it's been addressed in the past in an effective way, mostly through free allocation for direct emission, financial compensation for electricity or indirect emission. It has been addressed by recession and low EU prices. You know, five euros a ton is not a big deal. International, the access to international credits, 
And, and in the case of international aviation, frankly, we stopped the clock and we ended up in Corsia. So there has been ways to do this, but the world has changed and circumstances change. And in the case of the EU, because this is where the origin of this discussion is today. I'm not suggesting that I mean, Caroline the quality correct has been kind of slashing around for a long time, but the origin of the discussion today is from there. Next, please. So what we're we seeing, we're seeing an increase in new prices. The fact that EU is running out of free allocation to give to its company, companies as a result of an increase in a uh, strong increase in, in Paris Agreement objective translated EU targets. Next, please. It's a very simple graph that many will recognize prices, EU allowances. You go from, uh, from prices around you know, five to prices around 40. Next, please. The other thing that is important to see is that the EU gives free allocation in order to meet, uh, to address climate uh, carbon leakage and competitive. The graph on the, left would, on the left would tell you that under the current scenario, there is a mechanism in the EU whereby free allocation gets, gets allocated at the benchmark. And if there's not enough around, get, everybody gets a haircut. But under the current rules, by the year 2030, under the 65% ETS ambition, 55 translate into about 65 for the ETS, you end up about a 40% haircut for everybody in free allocation. Now that is pretty dramatic. At least, at least if I had a steel mill, I would be quite, quite worried. The, the, the thing on the right shows you what at the benchmark people should get, those are the bars in terms of free allocation at the benchmark. And those, the lines show you what is the ETS cap at 58% to 65% in 2050. And what you see is not a matter of the fact there's not enough reallocation. There's simply not enough allowances to meet a, a, uh, the, uh, the requirement for free allocation to shield EU industry from uh, trade and competitiveness issues. Next, please. So what do we know so far? What we know so far is we know that, that there is a political commitment from uh, President van der Leyen, which was expressed in the political guidelines of July 2019, which refers to border carbon, uh, carbon border tax complying with WTO and selected to, uh, and, and, and uh, starting with selected sectors and gradually extended. Next, please. We also know where we are right now. Where we are right now is that the EU has a political process for legislation. You know, frankly, as a Canadian, it took me a long time to understand Brussels. I mean, it is, I still don't understand it very well, but you know, the, the Canadian political process is very simple compared to this. But where they are right now, it is basically they've done a public consultation and they will be issuing by the end of, by sometime in the middle of June, an impact assessment and a proposal. And once the proposal is out, in principle, it should take somewhere with, with the legislation of this importance somewhere around two years to get it through the, the parliament and, and the council and the trialogue and reconciliation. Next, please. What does the, how does the EU see this? The EU see this as a number of options. One of them is a tax applied on imports at the border or as an extension of the ETS and buying, forcing importers to buying stuff from under the cap or from an infinite pool, so a virtual ETS or a carbon tax, a consumption charge. It is not really an adjustment at the border. That's more of an internal adjustment that is applied on products uh, in sector that are risk, at risk of carbon leakage and would apply to EU production as well as to imports. So you got three of them at the border, one of them more of a domestic approach. Next, please. Now, this is, is work in progress and we have no idea except what we've seen in terms of some of the commission documents. However, the parliament is taken the, 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 one of the prerogatives to have an own initiative and give an opinion. And the opinion is, you know, in, in the case, it gives you some indication where the parliament is, one of the three bodies, the fact that they are looking at imports with possible exports, but not super enthusiastic, a very caveat, very qualified things about exports. Uh, 
the fact that uh, crediting for credit for foreign policies is open to interpretation, not sure whether it's only carbon pricing or not. Uh, we're looking at what kind of emission scopes, whether the direct, indirect, or scope three emissions. So they're all kind of, of indication, or at least one of the three institutions would stand uh, when the time comes for, uh, for reconciliation. I'm expecting that, that glass to bang any moment. Uh, next, please. Then I will give you joy, Carolyn, because I will. this is my last slide. And my last slide is actually a, a passing of the torch to my friend, Aaron Cosby. This is work that we've done together and, and kind of elaborating the design elements. If you unpack, at least in our humble emission, unpacking a, a CBAM, a BCA or a CBAM, there will be a number of elements that we would unpack it in and a number of criteria that we use to evaluate how we what would be the choice between the option in each of the design elements. Now, I kept my word and I stop here, Carolyn. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Andre. And in fact, you're exactly 15 minutes. So thank you. Just two quick points because we've had some questions. Um, my understanding is that the um, uh, Canadian mission will post the video of this um, event afterwards with also a link to the presentations. I will leave them to confirm exactly where and also that we will run around five, five minutes over time because we started a bit late letting in all of the participants. So for, I'd just like to thank Andre for an excellent overview of how BCAs fit into this wider climate um, policy context and also for walking us through what you know about the EU CBAM proposal. So I'll now turn the floor directly to Aaron Cosby, who's a development economist by training. Aaron has worked on issues of trade and sustainability for 30 years. Um, his work on BCAs dates back to 2007, and he's really just a widely um, respected um, actor and expert on these issues. We look forward to your help, Aaron, in helping us understand the different options and approaches. You now have the floor. That's a, a tough challenge, but I'll see if I can rise to it. Thank you, Carolyn. And uh, thanks also, of course, to the uh, the uh, Canadian mission to the WTO from the government of Canada and the WTO secretariat for facilitating what I think is a really, what is obviously a timely conversation given the, the kind of audience response we've got. So I'm gonna to try to share my screen here. Let's see if I can pull this off um, and run you through. I'm going to take you uh, from where Andre left us off, uh, take you through what, uh, he, he's given us an overview of why we're here. Why, why are we talking about BCAs? I'm going to try to uh, talk about what actually a BCA is. So his last slide ended with uh, some uh, design considerations, um, and it's important to understand why we why we list those. A BCA is not a single homogeneous instrument that we can talk about uh, its its merits, its uh, strengths, its weaknesses. We can't say in the abstract whether it prevents leakage, whether it protects against competitiveness, whether it's WTO legal, because there are so many options for what a final BCA could look like. In fact, it's more like a decision tree than it is a, a single instrument. And uh, at each point in that tree, we have uh, forks in the road uh, down which we could go in considering one design or another design that give you very different final outcomes. So the kind of assessment we're looking for can only come when we look at the specific design elements. And that's what I'd like to do. Taking up from where Andre left us off, this picture of, uh, um, this, this gives us eight different design elements. You'll notice some symmetry between uh, how I lay out the design elements and how Andre laid them out. That's because while I do work on uh, BCAs for the International Institute for Sustainable Development in the Canadian and Chinese context, I have been working very closely with Andre at the ERCST on uh, the European element. And this framework is a result of that work. I'm going to take us through each of these eight design elements, and talk about what they mean and some of the implications for them and on a final what, what the final uh, BCA might look like. So first, the policy instrument. It's important to understand at the outset that a BCA is not a standalone instrument. It's an accompaniment to ambitious climate policy. And I think Andre laid this out. It's an accompaniment to either a carbon tax or an emissions trading system that tries to, as Andre said, um, uh, either prevent leakage as a result of that uh, underlying instrument or prevent competitive impacts as a result of that underlying instrument. So the question is, what 
instrument is a PCA accompanying? Is it accompanying it, as in the case of the European Union, an emissions trading system? Uh, that sort of carbon pricing. Um, you know, if Canada were to put one in place, presumably it would accompany Canada's uh, uh, fuel levy, which is more like a tax. But it's important to understand what the underlying instrument is. And it's important because it has legal implications. Uh, legally, probably, you can't export or you can't rebate on exports if it's a, if it's a regulatory instrument like a, an emissions trading system. If it's a tax, then, um, and I'm not going to go deeply into the legal stuff, I'll leave that to the real authority, and Ludovine will speak later. But if it's a tax, then under Article, GATT Article 2, 2A, you probably have the ability to, to refund in the same way you refund uh, a value added tax. So, it's important to understand what the underlying policy instrument is that a BCA accompanies. The second design element is the coverage of trade flows. So under most proposals for border carbon adjustment, we have, uh, under all proposals, we have coverage of imports. That is, there will be an adjustment to imports at the border when they arrive at the country that's putting in place the instrument. And the big question is, will we also cover exports? And when I say cover exports, I mean in the same way that a value added tax is usually refunded uh, at the point of export to uh, domestic importers, would we be talking about refunding uh, the, the cost of domestic climate pain uh, or climate pricing to exporters under a, under a BCA system. If we don't do that, then um, we, we may be failing at our objective and under laid out the objectives. We may be failing at the objective of preventing leakage or preventing competitiveness impacts for those firms which are export oriented within an economy. Uh, they're, they'll be facing the carbon pricing domestically, but they will be competing internationally, perhaps with those that have quite different carbon prices attached. And then the key question is, is export coverage legal? As I said, if it's a, if it's a regulatory instrument as an underlying policy, uh, probably not. If it's a tax, it's still unclear. And I think uh, Ludovine will go into this a little bit. We don't know. Geographic scope. Here the question is, uh, will the instrument exempt any countries as countries on the basis of their country um, uh, characteristics. And we could contemplate excluding least developed countries who have contributed least to climate change and will be suffering most from it. Uh, we could contemplate excluding those countries that have a high climate ambition, for example, an ambitious nationally determined contribution under the Paris Agreement. Um, the question is, uh, the, the problem is that if we do this, of course, we're probably violating Article 1 of the GATT. It's an MFN violation. Um, it may need saving by Article 20. In fact, most, most uh, BCAs uh, will need saving eventually by Article 20 for one reason or another. Um, it, it may be that under the uh, enabling clause, we can file, we could uh, justify uh, exempting least developed countries or developing countries. But the, the other problem with this sort of a mechanism, uh, with, with choosing to exercise any sort of geographic exemption, is that it has the implementing country at some level judging the adequacy of other countries' climate actions. Um, and this gets back to the sort of bottom-up nature of the Paris Agreement, as Andre laid it out, which uh, explicitly does not judge the adequacy of other countries' climate actions. It's, a, it's a, an agreement in which countries are putting forward their nationally determined contributions. So it runs somewhat contrary to the spirit of the Paris Agreement and probably creates problems under any sort of an Article 20 defense. I'm running quickly through these, I'm sorry, but uh, as Carolyn has said, these slides and the recording will be available after. The next design element is sectoral scope. So we've put in place this instrument. What sectors will be covered by the instrument? Now, from the perspective of preventing leakage, uh, in an ideal world, you would cover everything and then you would prevent all leakage. But of course, there's a tension between uh, um, the environmental gain and the administrative feasibility. It's extremely difficult to calculate what the embodied carbon is in a manufactured good like an automobile. Uh, it's much easier just to cover upstream commodities. Uh, and from an environmental perspective, at the upstream level, uh, production of basic steel, cement, fertilizers, chemicals, this is where the most emissions intensity is anyway, and the most risk of leakage. So it might make more sense to cover at the upstream level. So typically a BCA is proposed to cover commodities, a clutch of well-known emissions intensive trade exposed commodities, such as steel, chemicals, fertilizers, nitrate fertilizers, uh, aluminum, cement, pulp and paper. These are the, the, 
the, the known suspects that uh, BCA is typically proposed to uh, cover, not manufactured goods, um, not agricultural goods. But the, the problem here is that the upstream BCA uh, in sectors that have a long and complex downstream value chain, and we can think here of chemicals uh, or uh, steel, um, if we only apply the, um, the BCA at the upstream part of those value chains, then of course we are imposing costs on the downstream. Those costs will be passed through from upstream. We're imposing costs on the downstream processors, but offering them no protection against foreign uh, downstream manufactured goods that have not been subject to that carbon price. So we may, we may be, if there is a high risk of leakage in the downstream uh, and we only cover the upstream, there is a risk there of leakage and competitiveness impact. So it's a tough balancing act. Emission scope. So what emissions are we actually talking about covering? There are uh, associated with any product or activity, there are three types of emissions. And I think Andre mentioned them, I'll go into trying to define them. This is a standardized taxonomy. Scope one emissions are those that take place within the direct confines of any sort of industrial facility. It's the, uh, the burning of fuels on site for industrial heat. It's the process emissions, the, 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 the uh, the results of chemical processes like the CO2 stream that results from the production uh, of uh, cement, all, all of the things that happen within the boundaries of um, within an industrial facility. Scope two is the emissions uh, embodied in any purchased electricity, steam or heat that's brought onto the site from elsewhere. Um, and scope three, uh, scope two is a sort of an indirect emission. Scope three is all other indirect emissions, and there are many. Uh, they include the emissions from the uh, corporate operations and, and business travel. The most important scope three emissions are those that uh, result, or those that are embodied in purchased inputs. So if you're a maker of uh, flat rolled steel, the, the emissions embodied in the basic steel you purchase are not your direct emissions, they are indirect emissions and the emissions from uh, transport of a good to market, and the emissions from the consumption of a good. So uh, the downstream emissions in the consumption of uh, refined fuels uh, when they're burned in an automobile are something like 80% of the total life cycle emissions. Those are scope three, they are an indirect emission. And the question is, which of these various emissions are we going to cover when we consider uh, a border carbon adjustment? When a good shows up at the border, which emissions will it be charged for? But we're always talking about covering scope one, those direct emissions. Scope two, uh, probably we should be talking about covering these or, or you know, if the objective is prevention of leakage, many goods have a very high uh, amount of emissions embodied in that uh, purchased electricity. Aluminum is sometimes referred to as uh, solid electricity. It's so, so high. So you, you might want to cover scope two. Scope three, there we get into some very tricky issues. We don't have time here to get into the particulars, but you might consider covering uh, purchased input goods, the emissions embodied in them. But beyond that, it gets, it gets tricky. The next design element, and there are only eight, so we're on six of eight. You can benchmark me against that, Carolyn. Uh, is calculating the embodied emissions. So when a good shows up at your border, if you're putting in place a border carbon adjustment, how do you determine uh, what, what the embodied emissions in that goods are? Uh, so th there are a couple of basic approaches. One is a product approach, and you could demand uh, the actual data associated with, uh, the actual data for the emissions associated with that product as it shows up, either shipment by shipment, or specific to the facility in which it was produced. Um, another possibility, and this one is uh, probably more reasonable, pragmatic, is a benchmark uh, approach. So you would, you would assess a default value. You would say that uh, any steel that shows up at my border, I'm going to assume that that steel was produced at the emissions intensity of some benchmark. You could say, I will assume it's produced at the average emissions intensity of my domestic producers, or the 80th percentile emissions intensity of my domestic producers, or the global average emissions intensity. Anyway, you use some benchmark to assume what those uh, goods have been produced like, and, and then charge them accordingly. There is a hybrid option where you could use a, a sort of a general benchmark for scope one emissions, because they don't tend to vary much from industrial facility to industrial facility. And then you create a regionally specific or, or national default for uh, scope two emissions because they do vary 
quite specifically, quite intensively between uh, operations. And then there is also the option to allow producers to challenge any benchmark with verified third-party data. If they, if they do better than the benchmark, they should be able to challenge that. Crediting for foreign policies. Uh, for, from an environmental perspective, you want to allow credit to those uh, uh, producers that have actually been subject to a carbon price in their own jurisdictions. This, this uh, sounds like a, a reasonable idea, otherwise they're charged twice. But do you also credit for non-carbon price based policies? That is something that is not a carbon tax or an emissions trading system. Um, this, is, this is more difficult because the instrument, remember, is, is trying to equalize for the underlying policy instrument, let's say a carbon tax. If you, if you allow credit for a non-tax based policy for foreign goods as they come in, then really you should also be charging them for your domestic non-price based policies. This gets you down a very slippery road. What policies are in, what policies are not. Methodologically, how do you calculate the equivalent uh, carbon price of such a policy? Um, one way or the other, even if it's a price-based policy, it requires a, a, basically a bilateral negotiation of what that equivalency is for each trading partner. And if you do allow for crediting, you give rise to the risk of resource shuffling. I'm not going to have time to get into that deep subject now, but perhaps we can get into it in questions. The final question, what do you do with the money? Do you keep it or do you give it away? That's the basic uh, starting point. Uh, you can either, if you keep it, put it into general revenues. You can hypothecate it towards some domestic climate related fund. If you give it away, you can send it to a multilateral climate fund like the Green Climate Fund or the Adaptation Fund under the UNFCCC, or you can somehow use it to help exporters overcome the barrier you've imposed on them by putting in place a BCA, for example, underwriting the cost of certification to your standards. The problem is that politically, it's very tempting to keep it. The EU looks like they'll be keeping theirs. It's a major potential revenue source. Uh, domestic constituents don't want to see their money sent abroad, um, but it's very bad optics for your trading partners and potentially you face GATT Article 20 problems because it doesn't seem like an environment, environmental measure should be devoting its revenues to uh, anything but environment, uh, perhaps international cooperation. So this takes us through the, the, the various different design elements that I think, I hope, gives you an idea for all the different things that a border carbon adjustment mechanism could be given your, your choices on those uh, different forks in the road. And I think sets us up nicely for, I hope sets us up nicely for the rest of the uh, uh, presentation. So I'll stop sharing my screen now and hand it back to you, Carolyn. Great. Thank you so much, Aaron, for a really excellent um, overview. I'm sure you, I feel, I'm sure many people agree that you've really set out the issues and questions at hand very, very well. Both you and Andre have noted the many legal aspects of BCAs, and I know there are many questions among stakeholders and governments about this. So to help us navigate that, we're delighted to have the benefit of the expertise of Ludivin from the WTO Secretariat. At the WTO, she's in charge of the regular um, and negotiating sessions on trade and environment, um, provides legal advice, conducts research, and was the lead author of a recent WTO UNEP report on trade and climate change. Ludivin, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Caroline. Thank you, Canada, for organizing this event and for, for having me. Um, I will try uh, immediately to share my screen. Hope this works. Here we go. So that's, that's done. Um, let me uh, let me start by saying, as a, as a representative of the WTO Secretariat, I, I must uh, clearly state uh, that the, the following presentation is, uh, of course, without prejudice to the position of, uh, of WTO members, to their rights and, uh, and obligations. Uh, it's uh, also not meant to be an interpretation of WTO rules, but rather the, 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 the intention here is to outline a few uh, ideas that I hope will, uh, will uh, contribute uh, usefully to the debate. Um, and maybe sorry for, for being uh, right up front a killjoy, but despite the very appealing title that uh, was for my presentation, uh, it goes without saying that I will not exactly answer the question of compatibility of a BCA with, uh, with WTO rules. Uh, but please don't leave just yet. 
uh, as uh, I hope that uh, I would still be able to, to share with you some, uh, some ideas that can help uh, and guide you through uh, this maze of, uh, of the legal debate on, on the BCA. But uh, as you could always de uh, hear from the, the, previous, uh, the previous speakers, uh, there are lots of different considerations uh, that uh, have to be to be put uh, taken uh, kept in mind. And uh, the exercise I'm trying to to do here is to to give a bit of a framework to the discussion, and hopefully this can be a useful a useful tool. So let's uh, let's get started. Um, bef and before I, I go into my first slide, just maybe. I can't spend too much time, obviously, on the, on the basics of, uh, of trade and environment uh, uh, case law and, and basic principles, but I think it's, uh, it's important still to keep two main general introductory remarks in, uh, in points in, in mind. One is that WTO rules, uh, as they have been implemented and, and, and um, um, applied in the, in the past in the case law, WTO rules provide members, we have seen they provide members with a large measure of autonomy uh, to their, to, for them to set up their own environmental policies, including in relation to, uh, to trade and the impact on trade. And even if a measure is found to be in consistence with basic WTO rules, uh, we have this tool, which is Article 20, uh, and which may uh, help, uh, may be uh, helping in terms of justifiability of the measure. If the measure does pursue an environmental objective, and if certain conditions, which have been carefully crafted and interpreted by case law, uh, are respected. And this is important because in any sort of uh, legal analysis of um, of a trade and environment issue uh, needs to look at, uh, at these uh, two aspects always carefully and, uh, and in turn. Um, moving to, to my first uh, slide. Sorry. Um, I'd like to, here I've just put uh, basically uh, a uh, set of, uh, of questions and, and, uh, and key features or elements. Uh, some uh, of them have, uh, or most of them actually have been mentioned already by the previous speakers. And the, the idea here is to show that uh, there are quite a number of, of uh, design elements that, uh, that have to be discussed uh, and have to be set up. And But every one of these design elements will have a legal implication and will, have, will be sort of considered in, in, in the context of a WTO uh, dispute. It's, it's not meant to be a checklist, but it shows the variety in one slide, the variety of questions that uh, will need to be, to be tackled and, uh, and um, addressed properly under, under WTO law. They are put there in, in sort of a random fashion. So just to put a bit of, a, of order, some of these questions relate uh, more uh, to, to the question of whether BCA risk uh, being uh, in conflict with WTO rules. And that's, for instance, the question of the carbon price, the calculation of the energy intensity, the certification process, the sectors covered, all of these questions are sort of key in, in, already at the first stage of, an, of a legal analysis. Some other questions there in this uh, in these slides are, are more uh, maybe sort of going to kick in at the second stage of an analysis of uh, under Article 21, um, the, the, if the BCA is found to be inconsistent, one would uh, have to also answer questions like, is carbon leakage really happening? Um, is, uh, how is the revenue used? Um, is there any international standard or international legal commitments out there that needs to, uh, to be followed or can be used as a reference? Uh, are there any exemption for developing countries? Um, so all of these questions are, are essential and they have been very uh, eloquently already uh, uh, presented by, uh, by the two previous uh, speakers. Um, moving on to the next slide, this is the, the sort of simple or simplistic, in a way, a framework I'd like to, to propose to, to address a, a border carbon adjustment. Uh, and the idea, I mean, it's on purpose simple in a sense is to, to try to, uh, um, to look at this issue uh, in, in a way that will uh, we'll try to, to, to a bit mis um, uh, dispel some of uh, a misunderstanding on uh, key legal questions. And that's why this is cut in these three uh, sort of steps. And these three steps have an order that should be followed. I mean, they really go from the first stage of identifying coverage. And here, basically, what we, we, we are discussing is 
what kind of regulatory requirement are we or instrument are we talking about? The second question relates to, to consistency. Once you have established some coverage of the, of the GATT, um, what, uh, you, what you are trying to do there is to match uh, covered re requirements and GATT rules. So once you have identified the, the, the GATT rules, you can try to see, uh, make, make this exercise of consistency. And so, of course, if consistency cannot be established, you have this, uh, this uh, sort of safeguard here uh, of justifiability through Article 20 that can uh, help members uh, justify a measure, even if it's found to be inconsistent with some basic GATT um, rules. Um, on the next slide, uh, so for starting with, uh, with coverage, um, here the, 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 the idea is really to outline some of the key elements which are very important to, uh, to uh, define in order to first sort of go through this first step of, uh, of coverage. Um, it's not uh, exhaustive, there are many uh, the potentially other ones, uh, and uh, there are sort of every line, every set of boxes is a, is a bit of a simplification. There is always lots of different considerations under each one of these questions, but I think they help go through sort of a checklist of issues that uh, uh, need to, uh, to be looked at when, uh, when uh, examining coverage of a BCA and, uh, under the GATT. The first one, the key one, which has already been touched upon by, uh, by uh, Aaron, um, is this question of whether we are talking of, uh, on a B, uh, about the BCA on imports or on exports. Um, traditionally, both BC, uh, BCAs were covering both imports and in exports because it was meant to be an implementation of the, the, the destination principle to ensure trade neutrality between trading partners. Uh, so it's a sort of classical type of, uh, of instrument that is being used, uh, typical um, VAT uh, in order to, reba to rebate and, uh, and uh, impose VAT. Uh, but uh, as I said, there is this two aspects, import and import export. It, as much as it is um, uh, clear that BC on imports will be uh, linked to, uh, can be linked to the GATT, for BC on export, there is a question of whether a refund uh, of a domestic uh, tax uh, before exportation can be considered to be a subsidy. And the, the, the linked question to, of the applicability of the SCM uh, agreement. So uh, this issue of whether the reform of, of a carbon cost on, on export can be considered a subsidy is an, still an open question. Uh, I, I, one would have needed, I guess, a, a dedicated presentation on this issue. So I will uh, focus more in this presentation on, on BCA on imports, but it is a, a major point that needs to be, uh, to be examined a little bit further. And, um, and where the debate is still open. Also open is the debate of, uh, of link to Article 20 and potential justification uh, of, uh, of an inconsistency in the ACM agreement with, and the possible justification under Article 20. That is also as well not, uh, not a clear, um, uh, it's also not clear in terms of whether it's possible to do it. Um, another implication to keep in mind, maybe for the, the for sort of the, the the second part or the third part rather of justifiability uh, on the of the analysis is uh, the question of uh, whether if if you do impose a, a rebate on uh, or allow for a rebate on um, on export, the extent to which it does not undermine the environmental credibility of the of the measure. And that's also an element that could also be used uh, sort of playing against the justifiability of the, of the environmental measure um, in the sense that one could imagine that there would be less incentive uh, for producers who are mainly exporting to, uh, to continue reducing the, the um, emissions. Um, moving to, on to the second uh, type of co considerations under coverage is whether the, product, the taxes concerns products or producers. Uh, typically, uh, the GATT is, uh, is, of course, meant to uh, address taxes on products, uh, so-called indirect taxes. Um, and indirect taxes can, are the ones that can be adjusted. There is, uh, it's a bit more complicated for uh, taxes on producers. They, they are typically not adjustable. Uh, taxes on producers um, are things like uh, import taxes. Uh, 
uh, sorry, income taxes. So the, that there, it's uh, it's it's a more com more complicated aspect, and in a way, uh, lots of this uh, of the, the the carbon taxes that are also being discussed can have characteristics that are of of both indirect and direct taxes. So taxes both on products and on producers. So it may be uh, difficult to disentangle the the two. Uh, when looking at the, at the legal coverage of, um, of the GATT. The third um, type of, of questions is whether we are uh, talking of, uh, about an internal tax or another type of requirement. Aaron mentioned that already. Internal tax is a, is a sort of classical uh, uh, domestic tax covered by, that can be covered by Article 3, 3.2. Um, if it is not a tax that uh, that uh, it is uh, that we are adjusting on, then it, if it is an emission trading scheme, for instance, this is an open question whether uh, the, the, some provisions of the GATT could be uh, could be found to be relevant and could be uh, sort of cover uh, this uh, this issue. And there is one, two aspects: whether you can bring down the the, the cost uh, of an adjustment on an ETS to an uh, equivalent of a tax. And then this would still be an Article 3.2, or whether you are looking into an old sort of uh, sort a new type of uh, of measure, and it is more like a regulation, and then it would be Article 3.4, which would be uh, which would be relevant. So it's an important question because there again we we are looking at different um, uh, provisions of the GATT, and uh, and that could be have legal consequences there. And the last point I, I, I made, I am aware of time flying, so I, I won't be too uh, too long there. But it's still also a basic question. I mean, are we really talking about of, about border tax adjustment under Article 2.2a of the of the GATT, or is that simply a customs duty? That's an important uh, distinction that also needs to uh, to be done. And uh, and the, the relevance of Article 2.2a is important because it does open the door. When we will look at the, the, the consistency aspect to uh, something more than like products, and that's an important uh, element to, uh, to, to look into. So going to, to my third, um, second sorry, uh, step uh, of, of consistency, the main um, uh, element of it is, uh, is uh, non-discrimination. I mean, there are some other uh, provisions, of course, that are, that are key uh, in, in, in this context. I mean, the Article 11 and, uh, and the quantitative restrictions could also be a, a relevant um, uh, provisions to, that could be also violated. But in the, in the current debate, non-discrimination is uh, the main one that we are, that we are looking into. There are two aspects of non-discrimination. Uh, I won't go into detail. National treatment, of course, and uh, and most uh, favor uh, clause. And um, I mean, there is not a clear-cut um, uh, distinction between the, the issues that I, I've uh, I've mentioned and the coverage and the issues that are mentioned here and the uh, consistency. Um, as many of these things are linked, and one, for instance, is uh, this issue of flight product. Um, I mean, this is one of the the um, the main uh, sort of uh, famous uh, part of the trade and environment debate of, uh, of the like product and the non-product related PPMs uh, issue in this, uh, in this context. Um, but what is interesting is that if we, if we are to go into uh, 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 the, the provision like Article 22A on border tax adjustment, there is an opening of, uh, in terms of the wording of like product to something more. Uh, it does uh, in include a, a wording that could be a bit broader because it's, uh, it looks into uh, adjusting um, uh, on, a, on a charge, which is equivalent uh, to uh, an internal tax. And in respect of products, um, uh, of an article from which the imported product has been manufactured or produced in whole or in part. So this sort of uh, conversion wording uh, is, uh, has been interpreted that uh, some, some uh, academic have said that it could be considered as covering a carbon or an energy tax, um, as uh, it would not be necessarily an incorporated part or incorporated article, uh, but it would uh, still be, there could be some ground for an argumentation justifying such, um, such a provision to be relevant. Um, I just need to jump in quickly. We need you to wrap up because it's almost twenty minutes. So I will I will go quickly to justification then. 
uh, and simply insist on one uh, one aspect, uh, which is that uh, uh, the basically the main mantra on, on Article 20 is that the, the, the measure needs to be an environmental measure. Uh, and uh, there are two aspects to that. Not only the environmental objective needs to be the center of the BCA, um, uh, and that is where we, we may be confronted with definition problem of, uh, of carbon leakage, which is very much linked to uh, competitiveness. It's important at this point to, uh, of the analysis to be more purely environmental um, and avoid as much as possible links to, uh, to competitiveness. And, and the second aspect of the environmental focus is that the measure needs to be environmentally effective. So there needs to be a contribution or a potential contribution to effectively, uh, I mean, to uh, an efficient one to contribute to the environmental goal. And that's absolutely key in the, in the Article 20 kind of justifiability uh, exercise. Um, maybe uh, I'll try to, 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 feel, to move on to the last slide since, uh, in, since you are in a, in a bit of a rush. I will not, uh, when, I mean, go into detail of this one slide. It's basically taken from a publication which just uh, issued a couple of, uh, of weeks or months ago now. And, uh, and it helps provide a good legal framework to uh, any kind of trade and environment um, uh, analysis. So I will uh, let you refer to it if, uh, if needed. Um, in terms of environmental justifiability, maybe one last point I want to also make is the importance as well of implementation. I mean, textbook analysis is one thing, uh, implementation is key. And in the context of, of WTO uh, trade and environment cases, uh, the, the way a measure has been in, is implemented has been in the past cases, uh, a key element of uh, any uh, kind of uh, findings on, uh, on uh, of, of this trade and environment dispute. So it seems the implementation phase is also very important. So. Uh, really, the idea is to encourage to a maximum extent to have a very holistic view of the of the measure and not uh, only look at sort of uh, key uh, criteria and so on, but really look in concrete terms how this can be uh, implemented. Um, and to to finish with uh, with my last uh, sort of concluding slide, uh, the the idea here is basically. What you have on the screen is a, is a take home message that I, I believe is, is important to this debate is that uh, there are lots of misperceptions that WTO rules uh, act as an obstacle to, to climate regulations. Um, but in fact, one should have the, the, the assumption that countries want to put in place a trade restrictive regulatory instrument to, to achieve a, a respectable goal. And, uh, and WTO rules are there to, to, in a way, to help the regulator to find the best way for that purpose. Um, and, uh, and in a way, WTO rules can be seen as a sort of safeguard against measures that are protectionist and that would end up at, at the end of the day focusing on the wrong objective and not achieving the, the stated goal. So in a way, uh, rather than using uh, WTO rule as an excuse for, for inaction, uh, WTO, these rules can be used as a justification for, for developing, I mean, and as a national justification for developing good and genuine environmental regulation. Uh, so that, uh, that would be sort of the, the, the final legal point. And maybe one last point, if you allow me, um, uh, Caroline, is to say that uh, this, uh, this exercise, this legal exercise is one thing, but at the end of the day, the most important uh, element is to try to, uh, to resolve all of this, uh, these issues in a, in a cooperative way. Uh, and I just want to, to mention the role of the CTE, the Committee on Trade and Environment, on, uh, for, for that matter, as uh, it is uh, there to, uh, to discuss and potentially address these kind of issues. Uh, also before a measure is actually put in place, so in order to avoid uh, a dispute. Um, and in fact, the city is already playing this role of, uh, of discussing uh, uh, trade and environment measures. And I think this is a, an important role that could, uh, is important to, to continue um, in, the, in the future. Thank you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Ludovine. And I appreciate that it's a very short period of time to go through in a detailed way and um, that you've tried on such a complex set of legal issues. So I apologize for having to squish you into a short time. I'm going to swift very quickly now to our private sector perspective to, to close out the panel. Um, so Steel Producers Association. Catherine represents 100% 
of Canada's steel production capacity. She's over 20, 25 year industry association graduate through experience, um, including also in the forestry, manufacturing and mining industries. Um, so Catherine, you have the floor. And I would just note for everyone that I'm going to cluster the questions and already send them to the speakers so that we can still have time for questions at the end. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you very much. And hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Carolyn, for the introduction. And also thank you, Ambassador, and to the Government of Canada for having, uh, for having us here today. Um, I am joined by a number of colleagues from the Canadian Steel Producers Association, as well as from other uh, Canadian industries. And my core task for you today is really um, to uh, share with you what's on the minds of Canadian businesses as we consider um, as we consider the, bar the border carbon adjustments. So I just want to confirm that you can see my uh, slides. Yes, okay. Great. So how I'm going to cover this topic is I'm going to very quickly um, provide you with an outline, <clears throat> with an overview of the situation in Canada, what our sort of context is, um, and then uh, introduce to you some of our initial thoughts uh, as Canadian businesses. Uh, these are these are certainly uh, um, very near and dear to the Canadian steel producers part, but also uh, we've, we've benefited from some input of other of other industries. Uh, I will be clear that I am not an expert on uh, on these matters, but certainly um, we do, uh, you know, we do represent uh, business uh, business interests. Um, so to get started, I just wanted to point out a couple of facts, uh, respective of Can in, in terms of Canada's climate context. First of all, uh, as you may be aware, Canada represents about 2% of global emissions. And I just wanted to share with you a couple of charts to identify the sources of those emissions. So you can see them by an economic sector on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, you can see it by uh, industry emission breakdown. The, uh, on the right-hand side, the 16 million tons is us uh, over in the dark blue uh, pie, uh, pie piece. Um, we are in steel, a very hard to abate sector. We have 70% 70, 70 or so of our emissions are process, in, are process emissions, and we have uh, very uh, difficult circumstances to reduce those emissions. Uh, but never, never, nevertheless, um, we are taking some steps, and I will be talking to you about that momentarily. Um, so while we represent 2% of global emissions in Canada, I think it's safe to say that Canada is taking action on climate change. And what I wanted to provide as this context is um, just let you know that there is a Canadian climate change framework. It is based on the concept of four main pillars. Uh, carbon pricing, of course, is a significant um, area for large emitters. Um, there is uh, currently a $30 per ton price on carbon. This will, um, this will advance up to $50 a ton in 2022. And we have now received signals from our government uh, that this price will then start to escalate uh, annually by $15 a ton such that it is $170 a ton by 2030. And it's really this carbon price trajectory um, that is driving our concern in the industry related to the com our competitiveness um, versus the other steel producers in the world that may not be facing uh, the same burden. Uh, there are three other pillars, of course, the complementary actions, clean fuel standards, electrification requirements are in there, uh, also support of clean technology development, and ultimately some adaptation and climate resiliency approaches for our country. So Canadian steel producers uh, make some of the greenest steel in the world, which, uh, and we're very proud of that, but we also wanted to um, in increase our responsiveness, if you will, in the face of governmental market and civil society expectations. So in March of 2020, we, we released uh, as an association our climate call to action, which has which is a consensus document amongst all of our members. This, um, this action or this vision uh, sets our course uh, for an ambitious goal, an aspirational goal to achieve net zero by, 20, by 2050. This will be very difficult, but uh, it is absolutely our, our goal and, and the direction we want to head. <clears throat> 
Um, in order to achieve this, we've given great thought and consideration to different aspects that we will need. And certainly we've identified carbon border measures as a potentially important area to be better understood. So in preparation for today, we've talked to, uh, we are, we want to first flag that the, the emission intensive trade exposed sectors in Canada are engaging on this topic and we see opportunities, but also concerns related to how BCAs might work. And I think I'll touch on a number of the points that have been raised by the previous speakers uh, and give you some of our initial thoughts related to that. Um, from our perspective, I've mentioned, we've been considering the role of BCA in our, in our vision and our plan and how we move forward. And we've also in, uh, sought the input of some others. So I'm really pleased to share with you some of those initial views from the Canadian steel producers and work on this will continue. So this please recognize that this is kind of the start, what we hope is the start of a conversation. So first and foremost, I wanted to um, identify you know, our view of some principles for, for border carbon adjustments in Canada. And we've definitely, you know, from our perspective, BCA should play a role in the smooth, manageable, and frankly, competitive transition of the heavy industry sector to the net zero economy. So they really, we really do believe that, that border carbon adjustments need to give that competitiveness consideration. Um, the support for our competitiveness overall, however, is really, um, we see BCAs as being additional, and I think the word that was used earlier was uh, an accompaniment, if you will, to the carbon pricing system. So, and that is exactly how we view, it, we view them. Um, how we are managed, how our emissions are managed should be done within our national construct and our national climate plan, including our, our existing carbon pricing scheme. And um, it is really from our perspective, the critical instrument for protecting our competitiveness. It gives due consideration to many aspects, wide ranging business considerations. And we don't uh, really believe that the tool of the BCA should, we don't believe it as a management tool on our production or on our exports. We believe that border carbon adjustments should really target the cost, the climate cost burdens we face and mirror that on imports. Finally, um, we don't believe that there should be any restriction in trade. We're very concerned about that. Um, we definitely want a message to our to governments to be careful. And from Canadians' perspective, we hope that our government will stay in lockstep with our key trading partners. Our, our economy is deeply integrated with the United States, for example, and we really see this actually as a potential opportunity for our governments in Canada and the US to collaborate on the development of the border carbon adjustment mechanism. On the issue of scope, uh, we're very concerned with the potential for distortions and they've been <clears throat> well described by previous uh, speakers. Um, but of course, we just, um, um, we want to just make sure that it's not just about our upstream or between supply chains, but also downstream as well. <clears throat> we see quite a number of um, importers in the steel environment moving uh, to transform the steel product in some way and bring those manufactured goods uh, as a way around existing trade rules. And we think we don't want this to be another example of that. Um, finally, um, on the question of where does the money go, we would support the idea <clears throat> of revenue recycling. We think the best thing to be done is as the governments <clears throat> around the world collect this revenue from their border carbon adjustment, that they put those back into domestic efforts to decarbonize their hard to abate sectors or, or to decarbonize their footprint overall. And our... Um, we don't really, we do not believe that this would be something that should go into general tax revenues or general, uh, general uh, revenue coffers, but instead should be targeted, uh, as I say, to those, to those decarbonization efforts. On simplicity, we know this won't be easy um, and we, this will be difficult for us to achieve, but we hope for simplicity in design and application. And we recognize that this could become very complex very quickly. And you, I think you've got a flavor of that as we did some of the deep dives in the previous 
in the previous presentations. So I think it's quite important that we challenge ourselves to start with the idea of how can we make this as simple and as straightforward as possible. We would also flag that we will need some transparency and some consistency in methodology. We'll likely need some more monitoring and tracing tools as well to be effective. So a lot of work to be done. Uh, finally, and, and I'll talk to the specifics of the WTO in a moment, but we overall, we believe this can and should be consistent with WTO. So we really feel that the WTO can be part of the solution and should be part of the solution. But I want to acknowledge that this climate change is a massive and complex environmental issue and probably the largest one to be encountered by the WTO. It is a global challenge and will require uh, some really careful consideration and, and thinking at the WTO about how, how, to, how to best achieve uh, those objectives. Border carbon um, adjustment mechanisms, of course, as, as has been described, is at the nexus of trade and environmental policy and a very important element in global carbon reduction policies. But in our view, needs to be, we need to be very careful that, that it's done well and doesn't, um, doesn't erode the competitiveness of business. Um, the WTO provides a forum for member companies, and we think that this is a very important forum for border carbon adjustment, implementation challenges for the development of potential solutions. Um, we also strive for a multilateral approach. We think that would be a, a priority and a preference. Um, we would ask uh, that we examine the WTO rules and identify opportunities and barriers and try to get to the types of questions that have been posed so eloquently before me. You know, what and how will BCAs be set? How will equivalency between regions be determined? These are all obviously extremely important questions. And finally, I just want to point out that industry would welcome a collaborative and transparent process moving forward to engage on uh, on this solution as we consider how this, how this can play out. I, I do believe that, uh, you know, we, we're very uh, concerned about how, um, about some of the pitfalls related to this tool um, and want to do, lend our voice to the considerations of how we may, um, how we may design this uh, in response to such a complex global issue. So with that, Carolina, I, uh, I'll conclude my remarks and hopefully gain you a little bit more time, uh, time back on the clock. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Catherine, for that um, excellent overview of some of the concerns from an industry perspective. I think that's a really useful addition and going forward, indeed, we need to hear a range of different industry views on these questions and, and, the, and the challenges that they will face um, and ways to, ways to address those as well going forward. Um, so I'm gonna quickly try and turn to, to, to fit a few questions in before we close. I hope um, Ambassador Devor will agree that I many organizers here have said I can go five five or 10 minutes over. I won't go any further than that, but I think it's important to get a few of these questions in if we can. Great, thank you very much. So I'm gonna turn, turn first to Aaron. Um, there are three questions that, um, that I thought would be useful for him to look at. One is around um, how uh, developing countries, particularly those who are very dependent on exports of raw materials, will be able to balance um, the implementation of the UNFCC while at the same time having to cope with BCAs. And the second was that we had a question around uh, carbon clubs. Um, and uh, well, I'll let him e explain uh, the question. The question is whether um, how carbon clubs um, may work and whether they be allowable under the WTO. And the third one for him is just this question of, can you have a, um, a BCA if you don't, for instance, have carbon pricing um, at home? The floor is yours, Aaron. Thanks, Carolyn. And my apologies to the interpreters. I, I'll try to do this very quickly. Um, so on the question of, uh, I can quite quickly dispense with the question of how, whether you can put in place a BCA if you don't have an underlying instrument, which is a, a pricing instrument, like a carbon tax or an emissions trading system. Obviously, this is a live issue for those economies which are taking ambitious action, but which don't ever have a prospect of getting that in place. Uh, the answer is no. You can, there's, there's no way to adjust for the cost of internal regulatory pain, uh, either on imports or exports, in a way that strikes me as either WTO legal or methodologically feasible. 
without introducing so many potentials for uh, protectionism at a slippery slope. Uh, it just, I don't see how it could be done. Let's put it this way. Uh, I can't definitively say, but I don't say, I don't see how it could be done. Um, on the question of uh, the carbon clubs, it has been proposed that a bunch of countries get together and impose a common border carbon adjustment. So you have the beginnings of a, a regime similar to what you now have internationally for value added tax. It's the destination principle, uh, right? And it works fine if everybody does it, but uh, um, methodologically very fraught because every country will have quite different systems to try to harmonize, for example, an ETS uh, or the Canada's output based pricing system plus ca carbon levy and all the exemptions and the offset rules. Very complex procedure methodologically, number one. Legally, the fact that it's a club does not detract from any rights or obligations uh, existing under the WTO for those members which are outside the club. So the club does not give you any greater legal protection than you had as an individual country proposing a border carbon adjustment. Uh, um, I, I want to talk a little bit about scope three. The, there was a question whether scope three was necessary to be covered. This is both a sectoral question and an emissions coverage question. Take, for example, quite quickly, the example, the, uh, a steel producer, uh, a, a producer of steel pipe who is buying the steel from an upstream producer. If that producer is covered under a BCA, and it's only direct emissions that are covered, not scope three, um, it's facing the upstream costs passed through from the uh, producer of steel, and those costs are immense because that's where all the emissions are, but it is not getting any protection for the increase in costs passed down. Because you're, if you're only covering that uh, producer of pipe for direct emissions, you're not covering the scope three from inputted uh, goods you're subjecting them to potentially risk of leakage and competitiveness impact. It's, it's an empirical question how much that risk is, but certainly there's a case for arguing that in goods like, or sectors like steel and chemicals, where all the emissions are upstream and you have all these downstream producers, <clears throat> that you need to cover those producers under a sectoral scope and that you need to cover scope three emissions for the import, or input goods uh, under your emission scope. Otherwise you subject them to the risk of leakage and competitiveness impacts. There is that argument. Great, thank you very much, Aaron. I'm gonna quickly turn to Andre, who I was going to address. There is a question there about the, um, about, uh, Ukraine, about Ukraine. I'll let you explain the question and the, and the response, Andre. Thank you, Carolyn. Uh, what what the discussion has been because we had a number of town hall meetings and, and Ukraine was was one of them. Uh, a lot of the Ukrainian stakeholders raised the issue that they are uh, entering into many uh, agreements uh, with the EU and they are pretty pretty much close to an acquis uh, on the EU legislation, especially on the issues uh, uh, related to climate change. And they make the case a very strong case is since we are not EU, but quasi-EU in the implementation of climate change laws. We are in the process of putting together an emission trading scheme. Should we not be protected and have to pay uh, a carbon border adjustment? Uh, it's a case that has to be seen in the context of what is, uh, what is being considered and what's not being considered. I'm not sure whether there is a possibility. I, I doubt there was a possibility on the WTO to make the case that you have similar laws unless you considered everybody in the same in the same box. Uh, the two other things that I wanted to say, one of them was uh, the question that you asked Karen on related to uh, developing countries and the impact. And uh, you know, I see I see that question from my, my friend in, in, in South Africa. Uh, the, the Paris Agreement is uh, is considering common by differentiating responsibilities in a different, slightly different interpretation, but it certainly hasn't been abolished. And I certainly learned about uh, sustainable development and development priorities that this is something that needs to be considered. And there's no doubt that by uh, by imposing a border carbon adjustment, that you will, uh, if you want, I'm not sure how I put it, but you would nudge developing countries to increase their level of ambition, but level of ambition comes a, uh, an increased cost and increased price for export, which will make them less competitive. There's no, no doubt about that. So this is where I think the 
common by differential responsibilities of the UNFCCC will come into play into WTO discussions if it does. Uh, I'll stop here, a lot of other things, but I think you have other people. Great, thank you very much, Andre. I'm going to quickly turn to Ludivine and then we'll close the, the Q&A. But Ludivine, you wanted to weigh in on the question of, of um, um, the exports. And also, and also, I would love your quick view. We did receive one question which was just saying, for many countries, it's all just so complex. You know, this incredible, incredible complexity that you set around how to comply with WTO rules. And of course, it's a, it's a big question, but isn't there any way of simplifying that? That is their question. Thank you. Sure. Thanks. Very quickly, um, aware of the time. Um, on, the, on the question of uh, whether it could be a BCA without a carbon price, I mean, I, I, I go along the same line as what Aaron said. I just wanted to add a point in relation to that, uh, is that it's very important in the, in the context of just, just Justifiability of the of the measure when you try to to show that the measure is environmentally sound, um, the the case law has shown that what you want to look into is also uh, what are the other countries doing in terms of measure. So even if they don't do simply a carbon price, even if they do something with like regulatory requirements, other types of requirements who have eventually a cost anyway. Um, this is important to consider that when you you look into the uh, how sort of uh, uh, effective the measure is, environmentally speaking, and uh, and to, to show the flexibility in the measure that you really have uh, considered all different aspects uh, when you when you put in place this measure. So the question I found was uh, also hinting to the, that, and uh, uh, that's why I wanted to, to go back to this, that uh, yes, carbon price, this is the thing we need to consider, but that's not it. If you look only also at the, the justifiability part, other efforts that um, countries are taking are also very important to to prove what uh, to sort of show what they are doing. Um, on the on the question of of simplifying W two rules, um, I mean. This, the, the complexity comes because you know I'm presenting the sort of uh, the, the the legal all the different legal element to it. But the overall the the measure the, the way it is uh, the, the goal of, of such an analysis is a very simple one. You want to avoid that the measure that is being put in place is not an environment measure, but it's a protectionist measure. And uh, and of course you need all sorts of legal and technical details to go to get to this goal. But this, the, the goal is simple uh, in, in a way, uh, in, uh, and I don't want to sound too rosy there, but it is still um, good to have this kind of, of, of check, checks there uh, in order to avoid this situation where environment issues and protection is used as an excuse simply to introduce uh, protectionists through, the, through the, the back door. So I'm not sure simplification would be a good thing eventually at the end of the road, as you would lose on, uh, on, this, on these checks. No, great, great. Um, I really you know, appreciate that, that perspective. I think what we've been discussing today is that there is a tremendous amount of interest in this subject area. As more and more people who are not work, normally working on climate issues, um, but are very concerned about the climate or climate policy engaging with, we will need to find ways to help them um, understand and grapple with the complexities on the trade front. Um, of course, there were many more questions on the Q&A um, than I was able to get through. And um, I appreciate that that's, um, that's frustrating, but I encourage, I encourage you all to look at that list of questions because it really does give a good idea about the range um, of topics um, out there and concerns out there. I think, I think you all agreed that our speaker done a fantastic job, um, especially the goals of this event, which was to help support a more informed conversation. Um, the dozens of questions have really reinforced the importance of ongoing dialogue, dialogue on, on this issue, um, the importance of transparency, of consultation, and of ensuring that at the same time as creating ambitious climate policies, um, governments carefully consider and address impacts on their trading, trading partners um, and, and on their domestic constituencies, um, both of which are vital in the global effort to, to combat climate change. Um, the trends participation today has really highlighted how overdue we are in tackling a range of climate and trade issues. And I really hope these remain and go up higher on the trade policy agenda so that it better supports climate action to reach the Paris goals. So with this, I want to say a huge thanks to each of our speakers and turn back to our host, Ambassador Devorah, for his closing remarks. Well, thank you very much. And colleagues, I think we can all agree that that was a very 
uh, rich discussion. And my thanks to our moderator, Carolyn, as well as the panelists, Andre, Aaron, Ludovan, and Catherine for taking time out of their busy schedules to participate in today's workshop. A few takeaways from my perspective. I think today's event has underlined the value and importance in holding such discussions at the WTO. Discussions on BCAs are evolving very quickly. The trade policy world therefore needs to be ready for the shift. It will be important for all of us to think about the nexus between trade rules and BCAs. And uh, many of you said this, but dialogue, transparency, and coordination will be key as efforts on BCAs advance. And effective coordination also means a dialogue with industry, workers, and other stakeholders on this issue going forward. I could go on and on. Above all, I sincerely hope that today's discussions have served to provide additional insights uh, for you on BCAs and how they may interact with international trade rules. My hope is that we can continue to deepen our understanding at the WTO of issues at the nexus of trade and environmental sustainability. Tomorrow, Canada will co-chair the first meeting of the trade and environmental sustainability structured discussions at the WTO. As part of tomorrow's meeting, we will report out on today's event and encourage others to bring forward similar issues for discussions and consideration at the WTO. Before concluding, let me thank the WTO Secretariat for their support in helping organize today's workshop, as well as to the interpreters for their excellent work as usual. With that, thank you very much for joining us and have a great rest of the day. Goodbye.